uh, Global Art Forum glossary is SCORE. This is reappearing uh, several times over, uh, over the forum. Uh, it's already been uh, introduced by Andre Vida in Doha, um, and hopefully we will uh, get to know more about that in, uh, in a discussion that will take place shortly um, with hans Ulrich Obrist, Dominic gonzalez Forster, Tristan Berra, Tarek Atui, and, uh, and André Vida. Um, but we asked, uh, we thought it'd be uh, uh, interesting as a, as a, as a lead-in to, to that discussion to bring Tarek here and ask him to talk about, uh, in, in an impossibly uh, condensed uh, and schematic manner, because uh, the uh, a sort of uh, a, a schema schematized history of the advent and the appearance of scoring in the music of the Arab world, Arab region. Um, because of course, all all of these words that we're using, uh, if we if place is always particular, the terms are always particular as well, geographically, culturally, historically. Given where we are, uh, and given Tarek's own, um, I think, uh, incredible ability to navigate between uh, tradition of various kinds of tradition, 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 modern traditions, new traditions, uh, we couldn't think of anyone better. So Tarek Atoui is a Lebanon-born sound artist musician. Since 1998, he's lived in France, where he studied sound art and electroacoustic music. In 2008, he served as artistic director of the Stein Studios in Amsterdam, and his work has been presented uh, in many, many places, uh, in New York, in Paris, Seoul, and recently in Documenta. So will you please join in welcoming Tarek Atui? Thank you. Thank you, Shumun. Good afternoon. OK. So score in uh, classical Arab music. Um, maybe before I enter the score subject, it's good to frame things a little bit and say that when talking uh, about classical Arabic music, we are uh, mainly speaking about the period of the Nahda, the Arab Renaissance period, that goes from end of the 19th century till the end of the 30s. And uh, before I start going into details about the Nahda period and the role of music and how music was produced at that time, I would like also to thank Kamal Assar and the Amar Foundation. Uh, uh, Amar, uh, Amar is Arab Music Archive and Research. And many of the f uh, images we'll see here and many of the knowledge that I will be talking about comes from uh, the research I've been doing uh, through the Amar Archive on classical Arabic music. And actually, to frame things a bit, uh, this research started with a project called Revisiting Tarab, and it's a project I started two years ago with a long research as well, where the idea was to revisit classical Arabic music in a completely new uh, contemporary way and to learn from the teachings of classical Arabic music, how it's written, how improvisation takes place, how performance takes place, to come up with new ideas for collective performance and creating a new uh, uh, musical production and performances out of this repertoire. And when I started to work on uh, revisiting Tarab, this is where I uh, really got in depth and still, uh, like I consider that I'm touching the surface so far of uh, what classical Arabic music is. And to start a little bit by framing things, like classical Arabic music in the Nahda period was, uh, like the Nahda period anyways, like if we speak about the region of Egypt, Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon, was a really prolific, productive uh, period culturally, and especially on the level of music. Like this is where uh, opera houses had started to be built, where uh, venues for outdoor music performances were happening as well, where music started to shift from being courtyard music to becoming uh, music that is spread to a bigger crowd and becoming more and more popular, and you can hear it in cafes and cabarets and like spread throughout the cities of, these, uh, of the big capitals at that time. And uh, this is where also many production houses and companies started to emerge, like labels of uh, music, like uh, Baidafone, like uh, uh, Odeon Records, uh, Biblos Records, started to appear. And uh, we, we say that studios at that time were running like 24 hours, like really recording was happening all, all, all the time. 
And what you see in this first picture, actually, right here, is a picture of a very famous and one of the most famous singers, Yusuf al Manyalawi, who did one of the first recordings of Arabic music on shellac discs at that time. And you can see behind al Manyalawi and his band a gramophone, or uh, this old uh, uh, the ancestor of the turntable, in a way. And uh, what is nice about this picture is uh, that this also this this device was the main device for recording music, which meant that the recording situation was that these uh, six individuals sat in front of a cone of that shape and sang and played into the cone while somebody was turning the wheel uh, and recording the music. Now, what happened is when recording started, uh, Arabic music comes from an oral tradition. And this oral tradition is very much influenced by poetry and, of course, the history and the tradition of the maqam, or the scale, the harmonic scale, where, uh, like in jazz, you have a series of notes and composition and improvisation happen within this uh, grid or this uh, harmonic scale. And so the duration of music was very long. And uh, like a concert of music at that time could last three hours and a half to four hours. And one very important component in it is the wasla. The wasla is the musical suite, like la suite, as a series of different forms, like uh, a sang poem, uh, an improvised section, uh, uh, acoustic uh, uh, melodic theme written. Uh, wasla is an articulation of different forms going from the written to the improvised, from the vocal to the instrumental. And the musicians usually would agree on playing a wasla or compose a wasla a few minutes before the concert starts. Like they would come to play somewhere and say, okay, let's play, start with an improvisation, then switch to the sing section, then switch to a sang poem, to the layali, and so on. And a wasla like this could last an hour and a half. And things were very, very uh, oral in the sense that uh, it wasn't written. It was just agreed upon by the musicians before they go on stage. And it would go uh, for, as I said, long duration. And a concert at that time used to be three waslas, approximately lasting between three and four hours, as I spoke. And so when recording came first, it was a big problem for people because uh, when the cylinder and the shellac disc appeared, the duration, the maximum duration that we could record on like one side like of a shellac, like side A and side B, was three minutes. And so musicians and composers were very much confronted with uh, the necessity of uh, reducing what they were, uh, their relation to, like changing their relation to time and thinking com in a completely different way than the way they used to perform this music. Like all of a sudden they had to compile a section that used to last an hour and a half into three minutes. And this was really, really problematic for many. And if you are speaking about scoring, and score as a way to uh, uh, re capture uh, sound, recording for me is a way of scoring in a way. And it was one of the first confrontations where musicians, and some many of them, were reluctant to record because of this uh, relation to time and their discomfort with the formats of the time of the shellac disc or the cylinder in terms of expression and exp expressivity. And so to come back to this picture of Manyalawi and what was happening, the situation was that uh, you had the musicians sit standing in front of the cone, singing. Behind the musicians usually you had a crowd of people who were there as people to remind the musicians where they stopped because they would play for three minutes, the side would end, then they would turn the disc to side B, and the people who were in the back had the role of reminding the musicians where they stopped so they continue. And at that time, like really, the culture of, uh, like sometimes the musicians were carried away, or also the culture of drinking and uh, so forth, had everybody forgetting. So sometimes you would have side A and side B completely different, knowing that they had to be articulated. And one of the major challenges at some point was to record a full wasla, like an hour and something, uh, piece and they had to do it on 15 vinyls so it was like really a big big challenge for people and uh, that's that's my first point in relation to uh, rec uh, score and recording it was very difficult to pass from an oral tradition dealing with duration to something that is fixed and captured on a smaller format that's the first thing now the second problem that uh, classical Arabic musician in encountered uh, uh, with uh, the recording of music was the notion of virtuosity. 
because for a good musician or a good singer, his virtuosity was about never repeating himself while singing or playing. So one song, if, a, if the singer was good, he would sing the same song differently each time he performs it. And so the fact of capturing this on a, a record or, an, or on the surface and having it become as fixed format was also very problematic for many. And really, a lot of people refused to record uh, discs because for them it was uh, showing only one uh, aspect of different pos uh, several possibilities. And it was contradictory with this notion of the virtuoso as in uh, Arabic culture. And um, what, what is the third problem? Yes, the third problem also in this context was authorship. Because as I was saying, as coming from poetry and oral tradition, uh, there were no rights about like somebody taking uh, strophes of a, of a poem and singing them. Everybody had a shared repertoire. And it was common to see that at some point somebody would record a track using certain lyrics or certain poems and that one week later another singer would take the same poem and sing it again. And there was no intellectual property in that sense or no conflict at all about people just uh, recycling or re reusing the same repertoire but each one in their own way. And so also recording or like fixing things became a problem because all of a sudden this uh, idea of intellectual property emerged. And so as all of a sudden authorship was claimed. And also people in this were confronted to something new and that they didn't like. Now, if we speak about scoring as such and like of like really writing music on paper, uh, here the reticence of uh, Arab uh, musicians and singers was really strong. Uh, Scoring was um, introduced in the Middle East, uh, was first adopted in Turkey and from Western notation. And uh, the Arabs at that time uh, refused to go into the written system of music for also uh, two main reasons actually. One was out of a political resistance to the Turks. They didn't want to adopt or follow the same cultural uh, and aesthetical strategies as the Turks. And so they wanted to preserve the orality of their culture and not go into a notational system of music. And on the other side, uh, it was also about this idea of as things are coming from an oral tradition and there's a big role of improvisation, writing things on a piece of paper and fixing them was kind of killing uh, Arabic culture or stopping it from, de from developing because we are all of a sudden creating fixed forms and uh, like really, uh, yeah, kind of uh, making like something that was supposed to be very alive and very uh, having the capacity of renewing itself from within, becoming fixed and uh, immobile. And so things were started to be, uh, I would, in 1932, I think, 1932, Hassan, maybe you know Hassan Khan, you are here, uh, the Cairo, Muqtamar al Qahira, 1932, or 30? 36. 36. Uh, the, Cairo Seminar, actually, was an initiative that was proposed by first a uh, British aristocrat who invited musicians from all over the Middle East, not only from Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine, but really from the Maghreb and from the Gulf, to all gather in Cairo in an attempt to kind of uh, map the different uh, musical traditions and uh, practices uh, in the Middle East. And the Cairo seminar had a series of debates. And one, one of the most vivid and animated debate was the one of adapting the Western uh, system of musical notation. And uh, here, like, there were two categories. Those who completely refused the system of notation and who, as a, for the reasons I was giving you, were against it. And those who were prone for it. And um, the debate ended up by those who were against notation withdrawing from uh, the conference and notation being accepted, especially under the pressure of instrument makers. At that time, Yamaha and like companies of the kind also participated in the Congress. And they really wanted to uh, fix or like create a system of notation for, for them to be able to create a customized version of the instrument or like, like this idea of the tuned uh, oriental tuned keyboard emerged out of the Cairo uh, conference. And the idea was really to be able to uh, standardize or customize uh, musical instruments and musical notation was adopted and things for me are interconnected like this was really the time when the decline of uh, Arabic uh, classical Arabic music started to happen and we started to see it with uh, actually additions uh, 
exterior additions to the principles and uh, co uh, concepts of uh, classical Arabic music. Like, for example, what happened is that, as you can see in Al Manyalawi's picture, oh, okay, as we can see in Al Manyalawi's picture, the original uh, Arabic orchestra was composed of six people, like the singer, a kanun player, a oud player, a violin player an A player, and a small percussion, uh, the deaf uh, instrument. And that was the orchestra that performed in most of the situations in a way that wasn't amplified, that was acoustic, and with a very intimate relationship between the audience and the performers, like the audience being close to the performers, and all this idea of tarab, or like uh, trance, like uh, enchantment taking place uh, during the concert. And then after the Cairo uh, seminar, the Western instruments started to get introduced to the takht or the traditional orchestra. So we had bigger uh, uh, string sections, like more violins added, uh, cello added, double bass added, and then at the first, uh, like uh, also uh, stronger percussive uh, elements. And the idea of like the singer as icon started to emerge more and more, of like really having the singer in front of the stage. And it was, the, the bigger the orchestra was, the more prestigious it was for everybody, for, for the singer. Like Umkul Thum started to have these big orchestras. Then uh, Abdel Wahab also brought other uh, uh, additions to, to this. But what started to be necessary in this, context, in this context was all of a sudden the conductor. Like to really manage a big orchestra, you needed a conductor. And this idea through with scoring, first of all, the teaching of music started to change. And then with the introduction of the conductor, this notion of tutti, of like the, all the musicians playing together uh, under the conduction of a single person started to happen. And it kind of uh, also uh, killed the spirit of uh, classical Arabic music and what we, what we call in Arabic music uh, something very important called heterophony where actually each musician initially inside the takht could go at his own speed and like change tempos and you had the music that was very open and spacious and creating this feeling of trance, all of a sudden you had something that was kind of more marked, more tempo based, more military in a way, where this feeling of like this relation to time and this feeling to uh, what the wobbliness or the spacious, the acoustic space of the music started to close. and. Uh, the tradition of heterophony, or like really the teachings of classical Arabic music started to be forgotten more and more. That's really schematized, and I apologize for those who know uh, more in depth about music on how, uh, on the amount of simplification I did. But to bring things to uh, uh, my work on this uh, revisiting Tarab project and La Suite project, um, these are actually the things that struck me when I was doing my research. And when I started to think, like, how can we uh, take the archive of uh, old Arabic recordings or take this repertoire and invite musicians to compose new pieces and then make a performance out of these uh, different contributions and a performance that kind of revisits the principles of uh, performance in classical Arabic music. So something durational of several hours long uh, with this uh, attempt to reproduce this feeling of tarab or of enchantment uh, and also with collective, with the, to revisit improvisation and uh, all, uh, all these things. A real problem posed itself to me is how to score something that comes from an oral tradition and how to write a performance that is supposed to last five to four hours uh, by, without, uh, by staying close to the oral teachings of uh, classical Arabic music and not falling into something that was very didactic or directive to the musicians. And so here I can I will show you hop. maybe this picture of what happened last year in Sharjah at the Sharjah Art Foundation. It was the revisiting Tara performance, and this is the picture of the space and of how things were uh, were uh, organized space wise. And on this performance, what happened is that the way I scored things was really of writing three waslas of an hour, an hour and a half each and of like really specifying the entry and exit points of the musicians of saying okay you play from here to here and then you will be joined by this and that person and like the body of musicians will assemble and disassemble according to an established schedule and timeline and what happened is that here on the let me show it to you here on the side in this area 
uh, you had the backstage. So musicians were in the backstage and they had a chart in the backstage. They could see, uh, it's 11 o'clock, in five minutes I go play. So they would prepare themselves to go play. And I wasn't happy at all with how I wrote this because it was like a closed system. And it was a bit frustrating because all of a sudden, uh, like this feeling of tarab or this feeling of unity of like the musicians being together was kind of killed. And I realized that I made the mistake of forgetting about the teachings of the oral tradition and like fixing things in a way that wasn't natural or that wasn't really coming out of uh, um, classical Arabic music as such. And so the time after I did this performance, and this was at the Serpentine uh, last October, I completely changed my approach and the way I thought about this performance. So instead of, an, instead of an outdoor space, and a space where like performers were kind of far from each other and uh, like we had an outdoor, very spacious situation, the idea here and what helped a lot was having this dome where the marathon took place and where uh, everybody was inside a tent and in a closed space. And then the principle of composition changed, which meant that instead of having three waslas that were all written and determined according to a fixed timeline, the idea was to have movements or modules that were articulated in a way where each per where the performers knew what was going to happen 10 minutes in advance and what was happening here was that hope i can show you hope sorry one second i wrote a series of indications like for me like ways of improvising and ways of dealing with um, acoustic space with uh, relations between the musicians uh, coming out of observations and teachings from the music itself. And then in studio, we started to work on uh, articulations between musicians. Like this, for example, what you see here is one movement where like things would start in a trio situation, then move to like a solo situation, and then to a duo, tak, tak, tak. And in the studio, I was trying all these combinations. And out of these tryouts and like different rehearsals and different modes, I started to have to map to map out modules and different relations between the musicians. And to keep these in my notebook. And so like this, the day of the performance, I had 12 envelopes that were each, each envelope contained a section or a movement like those. And the idea was that 10 minutes before the end of each scenario, I would open an envelope and distribute it to the musicians. And the musicians found out with whom they were going to play, when, and some indications were there sometime about how to play and things of the kind which created something completely different. Because what happened then is that inside the performance space, um, let me see if I have pictures of this. Okay, on the side here, actually, what, what was happening is that all the musicians were sitting and listening to what was happening and always ready in a way look, or in an alert mode to interfere and to step, step on stage and be there. And this changed completely the flow of the performance and brought it together in relation to this oral tradition. It was for me like really uh, something that brought it like that made more sense in relation to what I've seen and what I wanted to reproduce from classical Arabic music. And um, I don't know, maybe s some of you, some of you were in London. I don't know, Hans. Sorry, you you were you were in London actually. I, I don't know, like as as a spectator and audience, what what was your feeling or impression of? what was happening like as an audience in relation to the flow and like to this here who was then uh, you know part of the marathon the next day mm -hmm. it was something which uh, uh, created an amazing you know moment uh, on a Friday night because in some kind of way it really created a community between the performers, between the people who came yes. uh, and the flow. And I had the feeling, I mean, Niklas Roek, the English filmmaker who is my na neighbor in London, he was always saying like, you know, when he does a film, he doesn't really write, uh, you know, a script. He maybe mm -hmm. has an A4 page of scribbles mm. and then the film kind of evolves organically. And that's obviously something I've been interested in, in relation to exhibitions and I was amazed how you somehow do this with such, uh, uh, you know, musical events where basically in an almost organic way, you know, it doesn't seem to be planned, mm. yet it sort of, it writes itself whilst it happens. It almost had yes. the feeling that the score was written oh. Oh. as we went on. Now, one of the oh. things which fascinated me, you know, looking at that was that I had the feeling that we were all, you know, and we were obviously in a double position because on the one hand we were the, uh, I was the co-organizer and on the other hand, as you say, I was also the audience. I was mm. one of the members of the many members of the audience. And I was kind of wondering, the more the evening progressed, 
you know, we sort of testimonied a unique moment, uh, and it was an amazing privilege to testimony this unique moment. But then I was like wondering if we think now we're in 2100 or in <laughs> 2200, and you know, we are all gone, how would a future generation uh, mm. restage this piece? Mm. And it then also made me think of Pierre Boulez, you know, whom we went to see with Philippe Pareno, and he told us, you know, a score isn't enough. Mm. When we need sort of like modern score, it's the kind of idea of the score of the score, mm -hmm. all this additional information which is needed. And I was thinking like, in order to redo this piece, uh. someone would almost have to have access to maybe you or to the memory of these things. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little mm. bit, uh, and as you know, Dominic yes. always transports us into the future. Um, I was kind of wondering, let's you know, transport into the future. Mm. We are in 2100. How could this piece be restaged? Uh, okay. Well, maybe maybe first 2014 and then 2100. Okay. <laughs> but no, that, that that's that's great. That's a great observation because really, the more the more I do this performance, the more. It's really teaching me this experience of how can we score uh, while the performance is happening. Like how, how can conduction and scoring and conduction take place while the performance is taking place and not be like something established in advance or something that's fixed or like the master plan that we are all following. So for 2014, if this performance happens again, like one of the ideas that prolong and continue this idea uh, is the one of finding a way to be able to really write the score while the performance is happening and not to have like 12 envelopes and actually out of the 12 last time we played seven and the idea was like in relation to the flow to the energy to feeling the audience the envelope the envelopes were opened like each one had a different characteristic but the idea here now is to map a series or a different modes of improvisation different modes of relations between the musicians and to be able to, uh, while the performance is happening, articulate them together, maybe have a printer and have this printed out and given to the musicians as really a way of reacting immediately to what is happening on stage. And while now in 2100, if we compile all these things, I think the, the more also this gets developed, it's, for me, it's, if I want to preserve it in a way, it's really taking each time a series of observations and teachings from classical Arabic music and taking them as starting point. And then uh, showing a way of how through graphic scores, through some text and elements of how these elements are articulated and used as compositional principles for the performance. And this would be like, a, to answer your question, Hans, a, a way of really passing this to future generations, much more important for me than passing on sound or the sound recordings or the video footage of it. It's really about these sets of indications and teachings of classical Arabic music and trying as much as possible to use these as uh, head of, like, uh, yeah, so, uh, top of the pyramid actually, or the starting point and unfolding them this way. And, uh, and yes, like uh, the, the other thing is each time this performance should happen, like what, like what I do next month. Like now it's my responsibility and duty to go back to this archive and to redo a new research for each performance to take place. So to, to discover something new or to deepen the knowledge further in order to come up with new observations and like new principles of writing and composition for this thing to happen. So it's really a very delicate balance of staying close to oral tradition and preserving as much as possible the, uh, uh, yes, like the immediacy of, of this culture and it's, like what it taught us in its capacity to uh, innovate from, from inside and to uh, not fall into fixed formats and trying to transpose these into modes of scoring and into ways of writing. And this has actually influenced a lot my way of writing and what we will be discussing in the second part of this talk. So yes, this is where it stops. Come, come, come take my microphone. Thank you.